Hello everyone, welcome to episode one of Blood Songs on the Record series. My name is Ntabi Seng Mosiana and I'm an associate producer at Yellowbone Entertainment. And the purpose of this series is to have a breakdown of each and every single episode concurrent with the show max release and i'll be having conversations with the blood psalms cast and crew members to talk about each and every episode breakdown a little bit of each and also just understanding blood psalms as a whole so i hope you join this journey as we have a great and relaxed conversation of blood psalms on the record our guest for this morning is motusi Mahano, who plays king glitcha on blood psalms and this is the conversation Good morning, Otusi. How are you today? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming through and let's get into it. Yes, please. Fantastic. So, you know, from the trailers that we have seen, Blood Songs looks so divine and so African golden, filled with so much royalty. If you could give us an understanding of the era that Blood Songs is set in, it would help us a lot because it doesn't seem as if we, if I could step outside my doorstep, I'd see this Blood Psalms world. So in your understanding, what exactly is the era that Blood Psalms is in? Uh, well, it happens um, way before the Great Flood. Hmm. Um, yeah, way before like history started getting a bit complicated. Um, yeah, it's uh, before the Great Flood where, you know, undocumented African history and so forth. With your understanding, do you believe that time existed? Oh, yeah, I do. I really do. I think there's a lot that uh, has gone unexplained and there are too many holes in history for, for it not to have happened, I think. So now in episode one, we get to meet King Licha. Could you yes. please explain your role in particular and you know how you embodied the role of King Licha? Well, Licha is obsessed with keeping his kingdom. Um, he's a man who's super paranoid. He's done some unsavory things to get to where he is. Um, and how to embody literature. Uh, the language was uh, challenging. Uh, I'd call it Shakespearean Sitwana. Um, mm. So I focus mainly on the language. And um, yeah, I mean, and um, young literature so much, I just, uh, I played him as myself basically, but the older literature had um, issues I had to work through mm. and, uh, you know, or reopening old wounds and such for him. Mm -hmm. And the relationship between young Licha and the King Licha that we know today with his father, when we introduced to their dynamic in episode one, how can you explain further as to what was going on between them? Was there lots of undertones? Was there things that unspoken understandings or misunderstandings? What was the relationship like between the two of them? Well, I think Lich is always going to try and fill his father's shoes in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, he's never felt uh, quite up to the task the way his father would, is. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the battle for the heart of a young lady um, leaves a lot of resentment on uh, Lich's part. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the father is quite a hard man in a way, always mocking his son and never really being supportive in any way. There's a lot of focus in the House of Akachi in episode one. So what is the importance? How in the ranking, how is the House of Akachi important? And what is the relationship like with the other tribes that exist within the world of Blood Psalms? Uh, with the exception of one other house, um, or rather land, uh, the House of Akachi is basically the ruling class of, uh, of the land. Uh, it's basically sort of America today kind of thing. Um, all the other houses, uh, for whatever reasons, are entwined with what Akachi wants, um, politically that is. Um, and uh, it's um, also kind of a suppressive kingdom in a way, especially to the Chinese. Mm -hmm. I was very curious about the the, the Tinis. Well, I've, I've, I've come to hear that they call the Tinis. <laughs> it's part of me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. 
So now we're going to get into episode one. So in episode one, we are introduced to the world of blood songs, but in particular, it's the house of Akachi. We meet the father, we meet Queen Asili, we meet Yazazi, and we meet God Heka. So I believe these characters are quite pivotal in setting the tone for the rest of the series. What particularly happens in this period that makes all of these characters very important for us knowing what develops throughout Blood Psalms? Well, uh, they've all sort of kind of made a pact. Um, Asili was supposed to be the chosen Magi, but uh, wasn't and it was all dependent her plan was dependent on her being chosen and um, the baby was foretold that uh, you know was going to take over the kingdom so Lecha kind of tried to hold on to it but at the end he found it hard to get rid of his uh, little princess mm -hmm. and uh, it complicates things and and King Licha not wanting to let go of the throne, is it because Dazi is uh, a female? What What is the true gripe for him not wanting her to, to, to receive the reins of her inheritance? Uh, because if she does, it brings about a certain prophecy, which will be the end of the house of Akachi, basically. And he is paranoid uh, about all that. Okay, okay, all right. So then episode one continues to be explosive, right? So then there's this war that takes place. Are you able to elaborate exactly what, what was the prelude to this war and why it happened the way it did? Well, the two armies have always, the two houses have always been against each other. And uh, uh, what Lecha, well, it's debatable why he chooses to do what he did to his father. Um, but uh, because of that, uh, the houses kind of merge. Well, not merge, but there's an understanding, a peaceful one. And uh, Licha and uh, the old king, uh, they become rather good friends. Can you give us an explanation between yourself, um, the young bride, Undi Azazi, and King Licha? Because from what I see, she doesn't seem that she's supposed to be from this class, for lack of a better word. How does she receive the luck mm -hmm. and the eyes of King Licha and you know so she becomes the bride and she becomes the Maggi. So there's something really unique about her that firstly attracted you to her and there's something also special inside of her that you know that for her to have received what she had received. So what is it about Undi Azazi that attracted King Licha to her? Uh, honestly, I think it's just uh, love at first. I think he was really crazy about her. Um, I don't think any of them really anticipated uh, what was going to happen because once she got chosen as Mega, it really, really turned things around. And at the same time, he does have a bit of a, a qualm, a chip on his shoulder about the fact that his father has already had relations with her. And, uh, you know, while well, he's still wooing her and uh, looking to make him her queen. But was, make her his queen, sorry. Yes, make her his queen. But was the, because things went wrong, things went, went very, very wrong for her. And her relationship with the king, with the, the, your father, was that a willing relationship? Was that, was that coercion? Did she have any agency in her part regarding that relationship? Because it seems as if when um, Licha was quite upset about that relationship, but what was her involvement in it? Oh, no, it was coercion. I don't think she really had any say in the, in the deed. Um, and then Queen Asili has quite, um, I would say, it would be accurate to say a hold on King Licha, but right now I will say influence on his decision making. And so, unfortunately, Diaz as it reaches her demise right after giving birth to their daughter. And but what, what was the plot with? Queen Asili and convincing King Licha to, to drive him to do the act that he did towards her? Uh, she's got her own agendas, um, which I'm not too certain which they are, but she's held, um, she's been stringing along Licha 
and that way she kind of rules the kingdom. Um, she's been promising because there's a curse over the land in a sense. They haven't had rain in forever and she keeps promising certain things will happen if he does this, this will happen. Um, so that's how she strings him along and he's convinced that he needs her you know, to keep his kingdom. So between between um, Queen Asili and the the king, she seems to live in the house of Akachi, but she is from the Utawi tribe. So has she has she ab abandoned her people to to sit side by side with the king? Um, because in episode two we see her in the house of Akachi, and I'm just curious as to how the relationship has grown over the years. Well, she's made a presence kind of. Uh, invaluable to him uh, because she still deals with magic and and that's a big part of his uh, obsession and um, why she moves into House of Kakachi is probably to be closer to the king uh, easier to manipulate uh, he probably wants her there because he thinks she can bring reins and who, else, who knows what else he thinks she can do for him um, so I imagine it's accessibility. Just in particular, what is the relationship like between Zazi and her dad? Uh, her dad is, um, well, he's been unable to do what he's, what a city has told him to do. Uh, she keeps insisting that, you know, Zazi has to die. Uh, but uh, the king, I think, loves his daughter. He's really conflicted and he's been unable to do so for a reason. Um, yeah, he loves his daughter, but at the same time, he does not want to lose his throne or his kingdom. Mm, okay. And, 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 what, and how has been King Lichas ruling over the years? Because from what we see, there's a, there's a certain level of paranoia and fear. But just as a king, who is running the, the, the house and, the, and overseeing the other houses while King Lichas is sitting on the throne? Well, I, I think uh, it hasn't been too bad. I mean, his state of mind has been questionable, but uh, he has brought a relative peace to the land, uh, even though it is, um, you know, fragile. Yeah. So I, I think he's a fairly decent king, um, you know, considering everything else. So we are in episode two. We cannot delve further as to what's going to happen between three, four, five and the rest of the episodes. So we're just going to get into your personal right. experience as an actor, as, um, as a thespian, as someone who, who I can believe loves the art of acting. And you having met the character of King Lecha and having been asked to, to take on this role, what was the convincing factor for you to take on the role of King Lecha on Blood Psalms? <laughs> well, Jamil said, I have a role for you. And I said, yay. <laughs> no questions. <laughs> no questions, I'm afraid, no. And you've been happy with, um, with, with having taken on such a, a, a really, really pivotal character in the series. Um, yeah, I mean, it was really challenging. Um, but... Uh, he is uh, the hardest character I've had to play thus far um, in many ways. Um, yeah, so he is one of my favorites. It's been quite challenging. Mm, okay, all right. And now talking about the director, Jamil Bega, who really is known for writing unique stories. And this, this piece of work is really something I don't think South Africans have seen thus far from the kind of stories we've come to see on our TV screens and just where we're developing and evolving as a continent. How has this, this particular relationship with you and him worked for this role that you portrayed of King Richard? Well, honestly with Jamil, it's, um we're two kids playing at that point, you know, both on a movie set, both doing what we grew up wanting to do. So by the time we shoot, it's just, um, it's fun and games, basically. Mm. And did you have freedom? Like, were you given any mandate? Were you, what, what were you told to do with this role? Or did you just read and interpret? How did it work? How was the process for you? 
Uh, Jamil basically gave me the character. He gives you free license as far as the role goes. It's yours. You own it. You know, and he loves discussing. He loves debating. If you have different ideas, you know, it brings a lot more life into it. So, yeah, it's been amazing. It's He's uh, the actor's director. Mm. Okay. And in your opinion, why is the series so important in today's time? Why is Blood Songs something that we all have to watch and receive inspiration from, if possible? Why is it key at this time? Well, I, I think as well, you know, considering the history and a uh, sense of, um, like even in African history, it feels a lot of the time that black people are almost erased out of um, the history. And uh, this is important because it's almost uh, taking back a history that uh, has been forgotten almost. Um, I mean, it's all fictional, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's great to see you know, African kingdoms in Africa, being African in the pre-colonization and all that jazz. Is there anything that you'd like to talk about or just give any feelings towards anything? I uh, just hope that everybody really enjoys it. I'm excited for the launch and uh, yeah, keen to see how Africa reacts to it. It was so great having a conversation with you. Thank you so much. I do appreciate your time. And we look forward to seeing the rest of Blood Songs and the revelations and the developments that is to come in the future. Thank you so much. Remember to come back every week as we do an on the record conversation. See you next week. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, and share this video as how the content creators go. See you next time. Bye. <laughs>